not so wise. Might be a problem for you, but it's not a problem for the person who's prayed up and stayed up and ready to go down. My, 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 Amalek's coming, Amalek's coming, and whether you like it or not, Amalek's coming. And so now they're going to go to war. The battle's coming, and you just might as well face it. You're going to go through some persecution. You're going to fight, and there's going to be people lying on you. There's going to be people walk out on you, and people are going to persecute you. And there's going to be people that's just going to, just going to talk about you. Like you a dog, they're going to call you all kinds of stuff. People that was your best friends yesterday. You're going to find out they've been trying to sleep with your husband. You're going to find out crazy stuff. And you're going to be tempted to say, well, if God was really with me, why did he stop all that stuff? God is real no matter where we're at or what we do. But you need to do is hold on to Jesus in the middle of the night when everything falls apart because we've been my brother, we've been my sister, we do it for the night, but joy, joy, joy is coming in the morning. I can't give up, I can't quit because the moment that you leave your house, joy is riding down the road. Hang on, sister. Hang on, brother. Let talk. Let him lie because at the end of this, when the dust settles, it's going to be me and Jesus standing up. I know how it is. I've been in church for 22 years. 
actively engaged in church. Moses said, I want you to get the men together. I want y'all to go down on the battlefield and I want y'all to fight and bleed and I want you to stay there and grind. I don't care how long it takes. We got to win this battle. What are you going to do, Brother Moses? I'm going to go home and you're going to go to stick. Yeah. <laughs> now, you don't have to respond, but you put yourself in these guys' shoes. Moses said, I'm going to go home and heal and You're you, you going to say, why aren't you going to y'all? Come on now. <laughs> why aren't you fighting? Well, because what Moses is doing is more important than what they're doing. Because what Moses is doing isn't physical. What Moses is doing is spiritual. There's no power in that rock. There's no power in him raising his hands. There's obedience on that here. And he just taken that rod and slapped a stone, and the stone gushed out hundreds of thousands and thousands of gallons of water and, and, and gave three million people something to drink. That rod represented something. Moses said, I'm going to go up on the hill. I probably should have had the altar call already. He said, I'm going to go up on the hill, and I'm going to hold up the rod. This weird thing started happening. As long as his hands were up, Joshua and Israel, they were whipping them, beating them down. But Moses' hands began to sink. And then the Amalek began to push Israel back. And Moses would reach down and get all the strength that he could muster, throw them up again. And Israel would start pushing Am Am Amalek back. And he could only hold it for so long. And his hands are shaking. You know how it is when you're like a weed eater. And I hold a weed eater for so long, my hands start trembling. And I, I can't hardly really open my hand. And it locks. You know, you go for four or five hours. And that's what Moses is like. He's trying to keep it up because he knows. You see, he's on a higher plane. He's able to see down into that battlefield. And they're able to see. And that's what Aaron and Hur is doing. Aaron and Hur is giving him reports saying, listen, when your hands are up, they're winning. When your hands are down there losing. And so now Moses knows the responsibility of the victory is upon him. But the Bible said that Moses' hands became heavy. Somebody tell me whose fault it was that Moses' hands were heavy. It's nobody's fault. Nobody's fault. He's a man. Right? I had the same response. I asked myself this a couple days ago. Whose fault was it that Moses' hands God, our, our initial knee jerk reaction is Moses' fault. Okay, so you think Moses has, I, I was under the impression that Moses had an eternal supply of strength. No. Moses' hands are going to fall every single time. This is kind of where it got a little tricky for me. Because we got to look at this hill, and I, I don't want to stay here for very long. But him holding his hands up and holding that rod up represents at least two things. The rod represented the word of God. The lifting of the hands represents worship. And I wanted to tell Revival Tabernacle something. Our visitors, you can take this if it applies to you. God bless you. But I'm talking to those that are, are, are underneath my leadership. Revival Tabernacle will only be powerful if we hold up the word of God and we're a church that is a worship church. Now we do real good. I believe our church is a powerful word church. It's going to always be a word church. But the problem that I see in this house is we don't know how to worship God. We come in and we sit and we're locked down in the old church mentality. Move me if you can, preacher. And basically what they're doing is they're sitting there and they're waiting for that one song that just gets it, you know, the one that makes them tap their toes, and, and so they're not really worshiping, they're sitting there until they get blessed, you don't have to shout amen, I've not been here too long, I know what I'm talking about, they're just sitting there and waiting for the preacher, the preacher preached good, but he wasn't very anointed, how do you know, I didn't dance, I didn't shout, the singing was really good, but it wasn't very anointed, how do you know, because it didn't make me stand up and dance and run and leap and holler, what you're basically saying is, Worship is God blessing you. And it lets me know you don't have the first idea what worship is about. This church ought to come in understanding that worship isn't about you. Worship isn't about you. Worship is about Him. You gotta worship Him. I didn't ask you to dance, run, lean, pull, high, but there ought to be an atmosphere. There ought to be an attitude. When I come in here, hell or high water, sick, I will. Stop what God's done in me. 
not an emotional person. Let me slap your kid and see what you say about that. Huh? Huh? I'm not an emotional person. Let somebody write you a million dollar check and it not bounce. You be speaking in tongues and only have the baptism and the Holy Ghost. You be running around the church. Whoa! If you even came to church. You be so spiritual. You be like, oh, God is good all the time. You be writing out checks and buying houses. You now it wouldn't matter what anybody said to you. We get in the money and we get. It wouldn't matter. Don't tell me you're not emotional. I'm not telling I'm not telling you that you have to act like me. I'm not telling you you have to act like him. What I am saying is there ought to be a love in your heart for God. There ought to be something inside of you that when they start singing and the name of Jesus is mentioned, there ought to be something that makes you start looking up. I'm not worried about her anymore. I'm not worried you sit there and cross your arms and do nothing. But I've been saved from hell. I've been saved from sin. I've been saved from I wouldn't even be here right now. Had it not been the Lord who was on my side. And nobody stands and nobody worships. I come to the house of God and praise. I enter into his courts with that spirit. Everything that has breath, let him praise the Lord. Everything that has breath, let him lift his voice. He said, I love you. You don't have to be loud. You don't have to run around. But there ought to be something inside of you that says, Had it not been Jesus on an old road. I wouldn't have my home. I wouldn't have my husband. I wouldn't have my children. I wouldn't have any food to eat. I'm here. I am what I am by the grace of God. But you don't know what they said about me. I don't care what they said about you. I'm not talking about them. And I'm not talking about you. You would be shocked if you came in this house next Sunday. And I was sitting back here. Now, nothing wrong with that. I was just when we got pews. I don't want everybody up in that pulpit. But if I was back here and I was just sitting and nobody preached, no one preached, we sang five or six songs, sang for an hour, and we dismissed and went home, and I gave you no excuse or no reason. Every single person that knows me, you're going to say something's wrong with Brother Lamb. Because you know. But if I'm not in that pulpit preaching the gospel, some of these other men and women are going to be right up there bringing the word of God because this is a word church. But we have got to get to the place. And I'm not asking you for an exhibition of the flesh, but I don't believe we love God like we need to. I don't believe that we appreciate Him like we need to because the truth is, even if you're very sick and you're here, you can still raise your heart and your hands to heaven and say, God, I love you. I don't feel a thing, but God, this ain't about me. I'm blessing you right now. There ought to be a spirit of worship in this house. There will be the lost coming off of these streets, coming in out of darkness. How many knows it's dark out there in the world right now? Drugs and alcohol, promiscuous sex. I know that some think that that's fun, but I see the end of that road, brother. It is hell. I see the end of that road. And when they come in here, they're coming in here to see light. When they come in here, they're coming to see love. And when a lost come in this house and you look more miserable than they do, they're going to leave here and say, if they're not happy about it, I'm not happy about it. You need to demonstrate something that the world would want to have. It ain't all about church. You've heard me say that a thousand times. Don't you preach to me about that. I was the first one that came to the pulpit at RT and said, Boy, the church going to take you to heaven. The saints of God, I'm a firm believer that if you love God, you'll love His people and you'll want to assemble yourselves together. Why do we come to church? What's the Bible say? For saying not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. That's why we're here. We're coming in here to lift each other up. That's what I come to preach. Give me a hand, brother. Listen to me, listen to carefully. You tie this around your neck, brothers and sisters. 
And Aaron and her said, listen, brother. Aaron and her talking. He said, man, I know it's important for us to scout out this battle, but we already know how this is going to work. Aaron and her said, we can't be spectators anymore. We got to be participators now. And that's what a lot of us do. We come in this church and we spectate Sister Ashley sing underneath the unction of the Holy Ghost. We come in and we spectate Ariel, Eden, Sister Audrey, and Beth, and all of our singers, my wife, and whoever else it is, whoever's singing. We come in and we spectate. And we're saying, yeah, man, they're singing right now. We got victory out here. But what you need to understand is the leaders of this church are tired. I said they're tired, so you got your hands up. But you don't know how hard my arms are shaking right now. And there's coming a point where you're going to have to realize that there's more to church than going to church and having church. We are the church. We're supposed to be the church. And this is where we do corporately what we should have been doing all day privately. We ought to be worshiping people at home. Word people at home. And when we come in here, we're so filled with the love of God we can't help but tap our toes. We Even if it's off beat, I don't care. But you've got to fall in love with God all over again. I come from a background where they say I move with the Holy Spirit moves me. You don't even know what it's about. All, all churches for you is you getting blessed. That's all church is. You go to church, be blessed. Want to go get a blessing? Jesus said, "My house, my Father's house, will be a house of prayer, where we engage Him." Church today is not about us engaging Him. It's about this. Me engaging you in song or in sermon. And you might get in. And you might want to get in. You sure got in. And I must have me. That means the spirit overwhelmed me. And I felt poor. God, God bless you. I'm glad that it happens. But at some point, we're going to have to get our hands and worship up. And we're going to have to get the word of God up. Hey, so much to preach. How long have I been preaching, Brother Greg? Tell me. 47 minutes. 47 55? 45? How much? I don't want to wear you out. I come to preach. Give me a hand, brother. I was, just, I was praying in my office. They hit me twofold. Give me a hand, brother. I need a hand here. It's amazing to me how they expect Moses to fight in the field with a sword and hold a rod up at the same time. It's shocking to me. And at some point, the men of God in the church, the women of God in the church, have got to quit running out and saying, Yeah, those are women. We're women, brother Moses, we're ready. And you got to come over and get a hold of the hands of the man of God and lift them up. Because the responsibility is now shifted from Moses to Aaron and her. Do you understand that? Are you hearing me? The responsibility. You see, everybody's got their part. Moses can't be down there and be up here at the same time. Aaron can't be down there and up here at the same time. And her can't be down there and up here at the same time. Somebody's got to fight. And somebody's got to hold their hands up. Somebody's got to do this and somebody's do that. Somebody's got to clean and somebody's got to mow. And somebody's got to paint and somebody's got to walk the streets. And somebody's got to pray and somebody's got to preach. Every person in this house has got to find their place and realize it is extremely important. Now this is right here. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to hang my hat right here and, and, and quit. There's a spiritual aspect behind what Moses is doing that is so powerful that I don't think we'll ever really understand it. We see it again in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, he's he's, he's there and he's teaching, and the, the apostles are there praying, and somebody runs in and says, Paul, we got a major problem. You need to stop what you're doing, and you need to come down and take care of the widows, the Grecian widows, because their, their needs aren't being met. That was the problem. And they wanted Paul to leave the ministry and come out and take care of the Grecian widows. And I like what Paul said. And it would have made some of us really mad. Paul said, well, you, you want me to leave the word of God to serve tables? He said, pick you out seven men full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost, and you let them go tend to the widows. He didn't say, I'll take care of the widows because the widows were important. The daily ministration, the daily ministry was extremely important. But Paul said, you've got to understand, brothers and sisters, that you can take care of that. But I've got to keep my hands up. I've got to stay in the Word. I've got to stay teaching. I've got to stay praying. Because the truth is, we can do all the stuff. But if there's not a spirit of prayer, 
and a prayer covering upon this church, we are not going to last. Oh, I mean, we can do this forever. If this is okay with you, I mean, we're having church today. We had a great time today. And God has moved today. And God is touching lives today. But I want more than this right here. I want this city on the knees crying out to Jesus Christ. And it's going to take more than a man or a couple of men and women holding up their hand. It's going to take everybody in this house. And so they get up underneath him. And they hold his hands up. And they win. Do you understand how important unity is? Yes, sir. Sister Ashley, come, please. Do you know how important it is for Joshua to lead an army and fight Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur are only him? Do you know how important? Talk to me, saints. I'm right here. I'm right here. Do you know how important it is? For every person in this room to give of their time and their money and their, their gifts. It's extremely important. But what would happen is the army is fighting with the leadership and the leaders are fighting each other. They're over chatting with this one. Now, I don't have anything in mind. I don't know of any occurrence in the house. What I'm telling you is if we don't get to the place where we can lift up the hands and hang down, strengthen the feeble knees if we don't come to the place where we love each other like we're supposed to with a godly love instead of tolerating each other we love each other we're looking forward to fellowshipping each other we are not going to be able to overcome Amalek I'll be preaching this month I think one of my pastor buddies from North Carolina is coming up in the latter part of the month we're going to preach and he's going to, I'm going to request that he preaches on unity I'm going to talk to you about two things that God spoke to me about this right here. Number one, I need you to help me lift my hands. The person sitting beside you, you don't know what they're going through. We're the best fakers, we're posers, we can smile, hallelujah, and die inside. And we come in here and we go through the motions and don't even know that that marriage over there is just about broken up. And they desperately need somebody to wrap them up and pray for them and give them some encouragement and some counsel. we got people that come into this house on the verge of suicide. What? I said it, suicide. There's people in this room right now. It is very, very probable that there are people in this room right now that sometime between last Sunday and this Sunday, they prayed and asked God to take their life. I wish I wasn't even alive. And they're here right now, barely making it. But we're not really concerned. Would you give me a hand, brother? Would you lift me up? Would you think about something more than yourself? There's times that I feel like I'm on fire like right now. I want my fire to help burn in Brother Rusty's life. But you know what? I've got to be looking for it. I've got to be looking I've got to be reaching for it. Every time I shake a hand, I'm reading you. I want to know where you're at because I might need to lay hands on you. I might need to hug you. I might need to say, God bless you. I may have to reach in my pocket and pull out my last $50 bill so you can go pay your bill and you don't go down. Somebody help me preach. We're so in a hurry to get out of church. We don't even want to shake a hand, have an altar call, and we're gone. We got to get to the buffet at KFC. Wouldn't it be awesome if we loved each other so much? We just wanted to hang out and talk and heal, lift up and encourage and fellowship each other. You are not just anybody, Fred Langhart. My God died for me, shed his blood for me. And I see the same blood marks on you. I see the same blood stains on you. I've had blood family walk out on me. I told Brother Greg just last night, he said, there's no kin, no relation that I know of at all. 
but he's closer to me than most of my blood family. I would say that about a lot of you in this room. Why? Because the household of faith is something so precious. I understand your struggles. I understand what it's like to have the enemy attack my wife and attack my home and attack my marriage. I know where you're at. I understand what depression is like. I know what anxiety is. I know what it's like to fall. I know what it's like to sin. And when you come to me, I shouldn't be judgmental. I ought to lift you up because I was there just a little while ago. If anybody understands where you're at, it's going to be the household of pain. Give me your hand. I need help. But God thundered this into my heart and we're going to pray. Man's drowning in a river. I'm going to try to swim out and save him. They're going to train you a lifeguard. They're going to train a lifeguard. Lifeguard is a professional swimmer. You can swim better than anybody in this room. And they're able easily to swim out to the drowning person. But it's an extremely different scenario swimming out to them and getting them to the banks. Do you know that there are times the lifeguard has to knock them out? They're both drowning. Get them back to the banks. Do you know how many times that I've reached out and tried to help some of you? But you fought me. Do you know how many times sisters and brothers in this church reached out to you but you wouldn't give them your hand. I can't help you if you won't let me help you. You can't help me if I won't let you help me. Stand across the 